If I have a daughter, she will be named Izzat, meaning honor and dignity. And she will walk with pride in my household, and each step will carry her namesake, and her shoulders will be broad, and a scarf will be wrapped around her chest. For modesty, of course. And her head will be tilted down slightly, and her gaze lowered, out of respect, of course. And she will be beautiful and fair. And life may be hard for my sweet Izzat at times, while she stays home studying, with discipline. But she won't bat an eye while her brother and friends are out and about, and she's heads down grasping onto her medical exams. But at least she won't have to worry about residency, for she will be Dr. Izzat by title, but not by career. For she will not need to work, because I will find her someone who will take care of her, with money and status and power. And he'll be able to take care of her and control her when she gets a little too heated, like her hot-headedness when her father throws something my way. But she will be our prized jewel while she is untouched and untainted. And like that, she will go directly from my home into her husband's home. And I will be happy, for at least I've given Izza a better life than the one my mother had to see for me. These words were built from my world of reality. Within my culture, from such a young age, and especially as a woman, I was constantly given responses that emphasized that my actions completely affected my society, which is one of the reasons this young lady in the story is named Izzat. I would constantly hear the words Izzat Gibate, Izzat Gibate, or translated, we're talking about our honor here. And this honor dictated the way I was told to live my life. When I was younger, I was told to cover up and have some shame in front of male relatives, a sheer scarf having the power to control and honor and protect my dignity. When I grew up and entered high school, I started stepping into leadership positions, requiring me to stay late at school. And at one point, I was told to cut all of these extracurriculars because leadership was not a good look for our desi women. Stay quieter, be more reserved, keep your head down, and don't talk so much. I was told that studying business and going into law would make men not want to marry me because I'd come across as too dominant and too outspoken. And when I would cry out of the frustration out of violence, at the violence occurring to the women in my family, I would be told to stop it, stop bringing that up. It's shameful to talk about. And anyways, she probably instigated it. Is that there's an alter ego I used to describe how it feels like to grow up in this space. And as dark as it may sound, there's some twisted comfort in it because I'm far from being alone. This is a very realistic lifestyle that many women from my background have to face, if not significantly worse. So in high school, I started taking some of these frustrations and putting them into work. I started working part-time or volunteering at a range of shelters for women and children that offered services for those who had to suffer from child abuse, domestic violence, sexual violence, homelessness, and more. And throughout my experiences, I worked with so many women who felt like what had happened to them was normal or even well-deserved. So for example, I remember working quite closely with one woman who had fled from a traditional South Asian background she was married on the dowry system. She was heavily abused by her in-laws and her husband. And she only finally left when she felt like her child's lives were in immediate danger. But she told me that she felt her struggles were normal. She was defiant, so she had deserved the abuse. Following up on that, when her family stopped talking to her after the divorce, she also felt like that was well-deserved. Her mother would constantly compare her to worse things happening in the family, such as acid being thrown on her aunt by her husband. See, when we use acts of extremity, such as acid attacks, as a benchmark, our tolerance to inequality widens and widens. And I started realizing that these little common everyday things that our women experience, things that I experience, things that my future daughter, should I have one, will never have to experience, lead up to bigger, more horrifying, and more violent issues that end up with our women and children having to seek refuge in these kinds of shelters. They were rooted in traditional practices and beliefs, which leads to acts of inequality, which leads to acts of violence. So I started to explore this more, and I was having trouble understanding why I was seeing so much of the following. It seems like we don't deem our young South Asian women powerful enough to make their own decisions, so we control their actions and limit them from choosing to live the lives that they may choose to live. In contrast to that, despite not being powerful enough to make our own decisions, somehow the burden of our society lies on our shoulders. The actions or attitudes of our young women lie within, or the honor and dignity of our families lie within the actions and attitudes of our young women. And then I started exploring another pattern. While I was growing up, I was told so many times what to do or what not to do with the words can or can't, as I'm sure many of us have, have also been used to. 
I heard this so much while growing up and I still do. And then when I would finally muster up enough courage to question or to desperately or quietly question why some of these things were happening, I would get the following type of response. It's because that's something that our culture does or that's something that our larkia or our girls don't do. And then I'd get a follow-up of, it's about our honor, don't talk about that. But sometimes, if I was lucky, I'd get a, we're saying or doing this because we care about you and we want to protect you. And the seemingly intimate answer made these restrictions feel justified. But in noticing the same response and pattern being given to me and other girls, I started to become skeptical of it. You care about me? You want to protect me? See, the word care is used to hide something that I feel is not so, in it, it, not so innocent, the fear of losing control. And it's the same pattern that we see in abusive intimate partner relationships. It's a dichotomy between care versus control. Abusers hurt their significant others, whether physically or psychologically, and then justify these actions with words such as, I do it because I love you. Studies have been done on batterers, on why they abuse and how they justify their actions, and it stems from a lack of trust and a foundation of insecurity. And this dichotomy between care versus control is one of the many reasons that we see such high rates of intimate partner violence in South Asian communities. In fact, just two years ago, the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence conducted a study in which 42% of South Asian female respondents had reported saying that they had experienced some kind of abuse from their male partners. And that's just the number that actually reported. And this idea of gender inequality isn't just hidden in these research publications or organizations. There it's written, the way it should be spoken about, as a prevalent, accurate, but ugly issue. But one of the reasons our women continue to be treated this way is because of the way they're portrayed in popular culture and media. And one of the biggest forms of popular culture in India and South Asia in general is within our film industry, Bollywood. And to show you what I'm saying, I'd like to take a moment to watch a clip from a movie called Rowdy Rator, which starts two pretty influential actors, <laughs> Akshay Kumar and Sanakshi Sinha. So let's dissect the scene. Kumar is physically unable to control his hand, which defines toxic masculinity. Man doesn't, need any, man doesn't take no for an answer to have a woman's body because he doesn't need any answer to have a woman's body. His desire to have her is more powerful than her consent. This movie made over $2 billion at the box office. It was regarded as comical and funny, but that's a whole lot of viewers that support the demeaning way that our women are portrayed in our film industry. So when I was trying to find this clip on YouTube, it came up as a following title. Let's go ahead and view how many viewers that has. Again, a whole lot of viewers that's supporting this strange way that our women are depicted. So I wanted to see some of the thoughts that were associated with it. So I scrolled down to the comments and I started seeing comments like this, which rubbed me off a little strange. Or, So again, rubbed me off a little strange as well, but I knew that this issue was taking a worse turn when I started seeing comments like this. See, it's strange that a title and a film scene such as this is used to draw viewers, but it's problematic that it brings out such emotions of sexual aggression, thoughts on how we really perceive our women, and thoughts on, that make sexual harassment seem cute. This is just one of the many demeaning ways that our women are portrayed in Bollywood. Film critic Mayank Shakir once said, our films do not influence our society. They mimic them. So let's take a step back and look at the other side of the mirror that Bollywood is reflecting. And to do this, I want to share with you a few stories of our women who have had to suffer from the brute injustice of gender inequality and violence. Last year, a young lady by the name of Nusrat Jahan Rafi was burned to death after reporting her rape by her school's headmaster. The police had, reported, had recorded her uh, reporting as a mockery, saying that it was no big deal. Although the headmaster was eventually arrested, there was lines and lines of protesters demanding his release. One group specifically demanded that Nusra take back her statement, and she refused. And right there and then, they lit her on fire after spilling kerosene on her. Simply because she told her truth, but, but brought dishonor to her society. Remember her. Take Rish Makreshi, one of the 300 reported acid burn victims last year in South Asia. Rishma was trying to protect her sister from acid being thrown on her sister by her husband. And in that, two more men came running after Rishma, pouring acid all over her face. Despite being told that her face was too shameful for India, Rishma is now making history as the first 
as a first acid, uh, as a first acid attack survivor to walk the New York City runway. Grishma was lucky enough to survive and speak her truth, but many, many, many are not. Remember her. Take Jyoti Singh, also known as Nirbhaya, or Fearless, in the 2012 Delhi gang rape case. Coming home from a, from a movie with a male friend, Jyoti boarded a bus with six other male passengers, who then took turns brutally beating and raping her. Two weeks later, she succumbed to her injuries. There were protests standing up for Jyoti, but there were also many protests against her, saying she deserved what she got for shamefully staying out that late with the male in the city. Remember her. The question really does beg, how many women can we allow to suffer this way before a truly deep-rooted and cultural change actually occurs? As of the early 2000s, the National Home Crime Record Bureau reported that every 26 minutes, a woman is molested, every 34 minutes, a woman is raped, and every 43 minutes, a woman is kidnapped. And to put that in perspective, that means that at least one of each of those has occurred in this one student speaker salon session you're sitting in right now. We have the statistics, we have the stories, we know that gender-based inequality and violence is real and happening now. We see that acts of these are not institutionally criminalized to the degree they should be. Marital rape is still not expressly criminalized in Pakistan. The dowry system, while technically still illegal in India, occurs all the time and with bribery. We know that these issues aren't just specific to South Asian culture. Inequality is still deeply rooted across the board. So let's talk accountability. That's where we come in. And when I say we, I'm speaking to my generation as a peer. See, when we talk about changing the system in so many walks of life, we have to understand that just talk is not enough. Empathy and education are important, yes, but now it's time to take action. It's no longer enough to be a woke bystander. Just because our generation is younger and claims to be more open-minded doesn't mean we're automatically changing the system. See, there's a very, very small population of us that blatantly stands there saying that killing of women is good and inequality is good and rape is good. Most of us agree that these things are wrong and shouldn't occur. But just saying these things are wrong and saying them to others who also agree that they're wrong and preaching to the choir doesn't actually heal the wound. It simply puts a band-aid on it. Instead, we have to actively stand up to, we have to actively stand up to acts of inequality and violence. When we see film scenes like Rowdy Rotor's hot naval scene, we shouldn't casually or awkwardly laugh along with it. We should boycott the films that they come from and not financially support it. We should report these kinds of videos on YouTube. We should report the comments that are associated with them. We should write reviews about these videos. When we see harassment occurring, even on a more casual scale, such as Eve teasing or catcalling, we need to actively stand up and speak out against it. We need our men to speak up against it. And this is a big one and a hard one to ask, but this is the one where we need to come together and stand strong within our own households instead of playing the role of a woke bystander. We should encourage and help our mothers get jobs so that they can have some financial standing in choosing to leave a household that only delivers them abuse. When we see our men telling our young girls that they can't drive, they can't travel, they can't talk at the dinner table, we should question why and take the same sacrifice to lessen the burden of inequality. We should question why these actions are shameful when our daughters do them. And we should question the blurry line of care that's being used to hide control. When we see our young boys hitting our young girls and getting away with it because boys will be boys, we should say something to them and say something to their parents. Because boys will be boys will only continue as long as we allow it to. And our women will only be treated this way as long as we allow it to. My hope is if we fight, we will create a change in which our future daughters can live fearlessly without the pressure of society's izzat on their strong and conforming shoulders. Like my mother fought for me. Thank you.